Welcome everyone. Um, it is an absolute pleasure for me to be here today and to spend the next two hours or so with you and my fellow Palinists discussing mother language education in South Africa. And I want to just start us off actually, you know, with, with a little bit of uh, background on why we are here. Um, what is the Goethe Institute celebrating here today? International Mother Language Day, that's correct. And is this a day that they kind of like decided to have today? Or where does this come from? What's the back, background? Yes, absolutely. It's a UN initiative and it's been celebrated around the world for almost 20 years. And what I would like to do is read to you um, a little bit of background that the UN gives on their website to explain why this day is necessary and why it is celebrated. And so the actual International Mother Language Day is the 21st of February, which was yesterday. Um, so we are not too far kind of like behind. Um, and I would like to read this statement to you um, to kind of like set the scene and for us to understand why are we discussing this topic today. They say this, languages with their complex implications for identity, communication, social integration, education and development are of strategic importance for people and planet. Yet, due to globalization processes, they are increasingly under threat or disappearing altogether. When languages fade, so does the world's rich tapestry of cultural diversity. Opportunities, traditions, memory, unique modes of thinking and expression, valuable resources for ensuring a better future are also lost. And then they go on saying that out of an estimated 6,000 languages spoken around the world, 43% are considered endangered, 43%. They say that only a few hundred out of those 6,000 languages have actually been given a formal place in education systems or in the public domain. And less than 100 are used in the digital world. And I think those kind of like, you know, very brief statements and figures perhaps already our reason enough to say such a day was actually really necessary. And it's a day that celebrates and safeguards linguistic diversity. And with that, I would like to just very briefly introduce our panelists for today. And I think we have, we are very fortunate because we have very esteemed guests um, who have been recognized for the work that they do in their respective fields. And I'd like to start with Professor Jonathan Janssen. We treat him very kindly because he's the only gentleman on this panel today. Uh, and so he, we, we, we said he can go first. Um, professor Janssen, as many of you will know, is a professor of education currently based at the University of Stellenbosch. He was previously the vice chancellor and rector at the University of the Free State. Um, he currently also serves as the president of South Africa's Institute of Race Relations. Not? Oh, then we have to update the website. And what about the Academy of Science of South Africa? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> mustn't use the website. Uh, but what I do know is true is that you're a prolific writer and columnist and have dealt with issues around language and language education and mother tongue education in South Africa um, and beyond. And so welcome Professor Janssen. Next to him sits Dr. Makosi Koza. She has extensive, more than 25 years of experience of working in top and senior management positions in both the public and the private sector. She also has served as a um, public servant in local and provincial governments, including she was the CEO of the South African Local Government Association, SALGA. And of course, many of you will know that she also was a former member of parliament and a politician. But today, um, she's here to perhaps share something that not many of us know about her, and that is research that she's done into indigenous languages, particularly Isi Zulu, um, and a book that was published, and her activism in that, in that area. And then last but not least, here on my left, from your side, your right, um, Ms. Karin Britz. Karin is based at Ate Cafe, 
the Afrikaans Language and Culture Association, where she's the head of language. Um, and she's responsible for language service, projects, and the multilingual focus of the Arte Café. She describes herself as a language enthusiast um, that has taken her to different places in the world, including to my hometown of Rostock in Germany. Um, she also worked for a number of years as a senior lecturer at Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznan in Poland. And she currently is a part-time lecturer here at the University of Johannesburg, closer to home, and has authored and co-authored a number of national and international conference papers dealing with a variety of aspects of language, linguistics, multilingualism, literacy, etc. So I hope you will agree with me that I think we have very rich, diverse perspectives that will inform the conversation here today, and I'm looking forward to it. I hope you do too. I see some people are nodding, so that's a good sign. Um, and so to start us off, I will ask the panelists to be personal and share something with us that perhaps we don't know necessarily. And so the question to you is, first and foremost, can you tell us what is your mother tongue? Um, and perhaps you want to share a little bit more about other languages in your life, um, other than your mother tongue, and why are you interested in this topic of mother tongue education? Dr. Koza, may I start with you? Well, thank you very much. Um, is this thing on? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, my mother tongue is Isizulu, of course, Isizulu language. And um, I am very much interested in developing Isindu as a language. In fact, generally, we refer to Isindu as a collective now that we use when we refer to the languages of black Africans, of, um, of, 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 I mean, of black people of African descent. We, we call that Isindu. And I am trying to uh, embark on that very, very, uh, very ambitious project. But the only thing I can share with you is that, by the way, did you know that Abandu languages are like studying mathematics, which is about the study of patterns, a very simple thing. Just think about Isi Zulu verb words. Hamba, that means go. Kijima, can you see? Notice the last vowel. Kijima, run. Ula, sing. Tandaza, pray. Sega, laugh. Did you know that all our languages, especially Languni languages, when the, vowel, when the verb is in its basic form, it always ends with vowel R. However, that vowel R is quantity sensitive. You can only say hamba if you are referring to one person. If there are more than one person, you have to add suffix ni, ni, hambani, kichimani, sekani, jabulani. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've learned something already, haven't we? Um, can I go to Karin Britz next, please? Share with us, what's your mother tongue? Why are you passionate about this? Um, I know my, my surname is Britz, and Afrikaans, that means British, but I'm actually Afrikaans, uh, so my mother tongue is Afrikaans. Um, and I think why I'm so passionate about mother tongue education is because mother tongue education, in the end, might lead to multilingualism. And that's fascinating. If you see what happens to your brain when you are multilingual, they, they say that you, um, you will stay a little bit more longer healthy when you are multilingual. You will keep away um, Alzheimer's for at least three, four years. So I, I think it's also a, a health choice from my side. Um, and then um, I'm also passionate about the Xintu languages, but just the other family, and that's the Sutu family. Um, Sutu was my matric subject, um, so it's on the same level as, as German. And it's fascinating. If you study morphology and syntax, I mean, that's amazing. Um, I remember one class at university and we, we analyzed all the, the, the verbs and I said, 
oh my goodness, but Tswana children are really clever. And my lecturer said, how did you learn Afrikaans? I say, I know, I know, but it's just fascinating. So I think I'm passionate about mother tongue education or studying languages because it opens up new worlds. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think now I'm back on. Thank you very much, Karin. Prof. Janssen. Sure. Uh, it, first of all, I, I want to make a distinction between mother tongue and my mother's tongue. Uh, <laughs> my, my mother's tongue was Afrikaans, uh, but my mother tongue is English. My father uh, grew up speaking English on the Cape Flats. My mother grew up speaking Afrikaans in Montague, in the Boerland. But we were raised in English. They weren't very political. They were very, they were church people. And so I don't know why they decided of the two languages to raise us in, uh, in English. Um, but I love languages, plural. Um, I have no particular affinity to any one of them. I won't go to war for any language. I, I like the way my granddaughter, my only grandchild, she's, uh, uh, 19 months, I think, or 20 months uh, today, and uh, they unfortunately in New Zealand for two years. But um, uh, when she speaks to her mother, she speaks in Afrikaans because her mother was raised in uh, uh, in Afrikaans, even though her father's British, her grandfather. Um, and when she speaks to my son, she speaks to him in English, and when she speaks to both of them together, she speaks in Maori. So I have never understood, particularly amongst African speakers, conservative African speakers, this anxiety about language. I love languages. And if we could just learn languages the way small children do, with, with, without the emotion and the history and the politics and the complexity, and just enjoy languages, it, it does enrich your life. And as you know, in every language, you can tell a person, uh, uh, I always tell people, because I grew up in Cape Town, even though I've now lived uh, in other parts of the world in six of the provinces, um, uh, uh, English is still the only language in which you can um, make people feel small without uttering a word. Um, this is not true for Afrikaans. <laughs> You'll know immediately where you stand. And, and that's the beauty of the Dutch language as well as the Afrikaans language. So I come to, just to conclude, I come to the uh, to discussions on language with less of a nationalistic uh, or ethnic nationalistic fever about any language. I just think in the 21st century the goal should be to have children learn as many languages as possible and, and detach those languages from the more uh, miserable past that we had, whether it's 1892 or 1976, and begin to look for ways in which languages can bring us together rather than tear us apart. Now that's difficult because unlike my friend, uh, uh, Ms. Brink, I never ha experienced Afrikaans in, in, through white people as, 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 as loving, as caring, as, uh, welcoming. I always experienced it as commands, as the door that was kicked down at four in the morning uh, in, in where I grew up. So I understood Afrikaans as a harsh language. It's only when I became dean at Tukkies that I realized you can actually laugh in Afrikaans <laughs> and, uh, and pray in Afrikaans and, uh, and enjoy it and so on. So language has a memory problem, but as I said, um, the more you speak it, as I said in my book, Letters to My Children, one of the letters of the tweets was, the more languages you speak, the better your love life. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Prof. That's a nice kind of like bridge to me because I wanted to declare that German is my mother tongue and also my mother's tongue. I grew up in Germany in a very monolingual environment until I was exposed to the first other language, which was my first foreign language taught at school in grade five. And that was Russian. And that is why what others said at the beginning really did sound familiar to me. Um, and my particular interest is in internationalization of education. 
And I think in that space, language plays an important role, of course, especially when we talk about the mobility of people. For example, we invite international students to come and study at our South African um, universities. And language is a very important means of integrating people, but it can also be used to exclude people. And so that is the kind of like the dynamic of language that I'm particularly interested in. And then, of course, in the internationalization debate, the, the, the question of the dominance of English as a language that is spoken globally in many institutions, and I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, so I think you have a good understanding or a better understanding of where we all come from and why we are here and why we are interested in and passionate about this topic. And Professor Janssen already indicated that, you know, there is something that we actually need to unpack when we talk about the terms that we use. The official day is the International Mother Language Day. The topic here today that you were invited to attend was to talk about mother tongue education in South Africa. And so I think we need to kind of like have a conversation around what do we mean? What is mother language? What is mother tongue? In South Africa also we use the word home language. There's indigenous languages. What, what can we try and make sense of that? And I will hand over first and foremost to Karin Britz to kind of like lead us through this conversation to say actually what is mother tongue, what is mother tongue education, and how is it generally viewed in South Africa? Um, I think already with the term mother tongue, and when you said my mother's tongue, my father's tongue, um, that's problematic if you speak English, if you say it in English, if you say it, say it in German as well, Muttersprache. Um, or should we, so should we say it's my father's tongue, my mother's tongue, or mother's language, father's language, or should we refer to home language? And, and in the South African community, do we only have one language? I, I work in Soweto quite often, and I can promise you, there's not only one language in Soweto, and not only one language in one family. So, so sometimes you will meet somebody with a, a Sutu surname, and, a, and then I will assume that that person is Sutu, and then he will say, well, I grew up Zulu. And I think that's a reality. Uh, we, we shouldn't think about it like in a European sense of there's one language in one family. Um, just a short anecdote, uh, I lived in Poland for a while and I lived with a, a Polish lady um, and in the beginning we spoke German, can you believe it? In Poland I spoke German because that was the lingua franca and not English as what one might assume. And I told her that Afrikaans is my Muttersprache, my mother tongue. And she later told me she was so confused because does my mother speak Afrikaans and my father, what is his, his um, language? Because in, in Polish you refer to something like Jenzik Ojczyste, something like a fatherland's, fatherland's language. Um, so in Polish it's not Muttersprache or mother tongue. Um, I think we might still be a little bit trapped in a Eurocentric view of one nation, one language. Um, and I think that we sometimes think that we need only one language to unite us as, as a nation, as people. And we might perceive it as a, a, a problem or a hurdle. Um, but let's, let's go a little bit to UNESCO. Um, so the term, they say mother tongue, though why? widely used may refer to several different situations. So definitions often include the following elements, the language or languages that one has learned first, the language, so sometimes we talk about first language, or um, the language one knows best, and the language or languages one uses most. So it might be my mother's tongue, or the language I learned first, or the one that I use most often. Um, but we can also refer to mother tongue as the primary or first language. 
They say the term mother tongue is commonly used in policy statements and in a general discourse on educational issues. So yes, we can say it's, if we refer to mother tongue, um, it might mean different things to different people. But to get practical, I think that mother tongue or mother tongue education, if you want to get to that, is, is about the child. It's not about our ideological fights. What's going to benefit the child? So, if I can say something about mother tongue education, I think it's about giving a child the opportunity to learn in a language, all languages, who said that we can have only one mother tongue that would contribute to the child's academic success and holistic development. I think we should have a learner-centered approach uh, to, to language, all languages. And don't assume that there's only one mother tongue. We might have more than one mother tongue or first languages. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I perhaps ask you, Dr. Kosa and Prof. Janssen, to respond? To some extent, I think you will take some, especially the last point that Karin made about academic achievement and, and impact of language education on academic performance um, a little bit later. But is there something that you would like to say immediately in response? Let me remind, let me um, respond to this by sharing um, a practical experience that I had. My children um, went to boarding school when my son was one year and when my daughter was about five and a half years old. And during that time, my children lost their mother tongue, which is Isuzu. But they did not lose just the language. They lost the logic and intelligence that is embedded in that language. They were neither good in English because it wasn't their language. Whenever they are at home with their family, they were not able to participate and engage in the discussions or whatever conversations that we used to have as a family because they were feeling excluded. At the same time, they were neither good in English. They were not like your straight A's in English because that's not the logic and the intelligence that they have, that they possess, that comes intuitively from the fact that you are, you are born in that environment that speaks that kind of language. For example, English and Afrikaans, when they pluralize their nouns, they do so at the back of the way or in the middle. Yet, African languages, they do so in front. And again, African languages arrange their, noun their, their nouns into classes. Isisulu arranges them into 12 noun classes. And it is very, very quantity sensitive. Now, my children lost that. And to me, I think it is tragic when children lose that which is their first contact with the world. Because the, the language is not just about communication. It's also about how you interpret the world that you live in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Prof? Um, yeah, look, I think... Um, um, as I was saying earlier, you know, I think we need to be clear here that when we talk about languages, because that we can all pretend uh, and be nice to each other today and say all languages are equal, they're not equal. Um, I also don't think it's very useful to have definitional disputes around mother tongue versus mother's tongue. And so it doesn't matter. In the folks' mind, in the way people speak, you all know intuitively what we mean by mother tongue or mother tongue education. And, and, I, and I'm sort of going to go with that. But English and Afrikaans, let's not forget, English and Afrikaans are privileged languages. They, for centuries, you know, were the language, not centuries, well, in the case of Afrikaans, but they were the languages for decades, you know, 
that dominated, that were made official languages, and that essentially uh, marginalized the other African languages, because I regard Afrikaans as an African language. Um, and, and with that comes all sorts of problems, problems of status, problems of inferiority, problems of, of power, problems of inequality, and so on and so forth. So all the Afrikaans universities now have, historically Afrikaans universities, have made English their primary language of instruction. And I'll tell you why. Uh, they did that for the simple reason that they recognize, you know, the, the power that is embedded in Afrikaans as a primary language in these universities, most of whom now have uh, significant numbers of black, except for Stanford, of black uh, undergraduate uh, students. So let's be clear with each other that there are issues of power and status and inequality that are at play here. And that therefore language issues are not just linguistic issues, it's not just issues of grammar, it's not just issues of, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, communication, it is, in its essence, issues of politics. And if you don't understand that, you won't understand the turmoil that you see. I was just invited the other day, and I just said to them to take a hike uh, by some Afrikaans at Kinsterfeers, uh, and it was going to chair, be chaired by a guy who I don't think has much of a sense of himself, but um, uh, why are Afrikaans parents uh, raising their kids in English? And I said, you know what, why is this an issue? Raise your kid in any language. But it's this almost existential freeze, you know, of fear that I'm losing something. And this comes when your language has been dominant and in power for so long that you don't know how to share it, uh, etc. I mentioned the story of my, my granddaughter, Aspras, deliberately, to make the point that there are other ways of negotiating this minefield you know, uh, through embracing this multilingualism in practice, rather than to, um, uh, uh, to, 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 to deal with these very, very difficult issues of choice between languages. Thank God that most white Afrikaans speak, and language comes with a race, whether you like it or not, okay? Most white Afrikaans students that I've worked with over the years are remarkably different today than they were 10, 15 years ago in that they don't care what language they get their instruction in. I teach 280 of them uh, every Wednesday for an hour. And if I go into Afrikaans as a way of including them, they say, yes, I believe Professor Brad Engelsman. We want to au pair in Europe. We want to get a job in Canberra. We want to move across the world. We don't have the issues of our parents. That's good because it unmoors Afrikaans from its very troubled past and in that way frees up Afrikaans to be a language that we can all enjoy. I just wanted to throw that in there. Thank you very much. Um, you brought up the issue of privilege and as I was reflecting and preparing for this day, I reflected on my mother tongue, which I said is German, and how I speak it and how I engage with it in South Africa, a country that I've lived in for 20 years. And I felt a clear sense of privilege in the sense that I can go to the German butchery and bakery and the German bookshop and I can send my children to a German school and they can learn German at the university and probably get a job at a German company. And when I kind of like feel, you know, this is kind of like going towards the end, I can check into the German old age home down the road. Um, and I thought this is actually a really interesting conversation that given that German is not the previous colonial power in South Africa, um, why, why is it so recognized, supported, promoted by the constitution of South Africa, recognized as a language that is spoken here by a considerable community, and what does that mean? And at the German school, for example, we, we often have these conversations around the balance of teaching German, teaching in German, leading to a German qualification, but also recognizing that it's a German school in Johannesburg, and it's an international school, and there's more than 30 languages represented at the school and national and I think in terms of that institution, also for the Goethe Institute, perhaps we can have that as a conversation that we throw out there. We have a couple of colleagues here. What does this mean to be a German language and cultural institute? 
abroad, in, in, in this case, in, in South Africa. And it's often embedded in a, in a conversation around internationalization and access, access to global opportunities, global citizenship. So the topic for today, though, is, is the importance of mother tongue education. And I just, before we continue, would like to ask you to reflect what then is the case to be made for mother tongue education in this day and age? Um, I think if we look at the African um, continent, and I want to refer to what you said about English, um, if we look at Mozambique, where it's Portuguese, or um, other parts of Africa where it's French, um, why did the African countries choose um, to use English or Portuguese or French? I think the idea was to, to prevent something like uh, tribalism. I think that's the thing in South Africa. We would rather use English to prevent something like tribalism um, or to make sure that we are integrated socially. Um, that's a one way of looking at it. Um, the other thing is that they said, OK, we will acknowledge some languages like Swahili or Tsonga um, but then we will, again, revert to English. And I think we had a chance, chance in South Africa to acknowledge all the other languages. Um, and if you look at the um, metric results, the learners who learned in the mother tongue performed better. And I'm, also, I'm always worried about the children we want them to perform academically. But if we are going to pursue an ideology of choosing just one language, um, then we are not going to get there. I don't say that we should only take the mother tongue. And that's sometimes the thing that people say when we, Afrikaans speak, speaking people say, with the on the rug, yes, mother tongue education, people think, okay, it's just Afrikaans, and, or just Tswana. That's not the case with mother tongue education, in my view. Mother tongue education is my mother tongue plus a, a, a local, local lingua franca plus an international lingua franca. So in the case of South Africa, we live in let's say in the free state, and I'm Afrikaans speaking, then I will learn Sutu as the local lingua franca, and I will also learn English as the international lingua franca. We can take it to um, a country like Mozambique. I will learn, let's say, for example, Tsonga, but I will also learn uh, another local variety, and Portuguese, or I can choose Portuguese and English. Um, I think if we talk about internationalization, we should be careful to only choose English, because then we are only limited to a, an Anglophone world, Anglo-Saxon world. Um, I just think that we should not limit ourselves to just one language, um, but also value mother tongue education for its academic results. Thank you. Dr. Koza? You know, um, how do I begin? Um, first of all, I think we let, we, let's all acknowledge that English is a global language and that it does assist learners to access opportunities globally. There is no question about that. However, let's also understand that we are engaging on this very topic in a continent where language was used as a tool of domination, oppression, and exclusion. 
Let us also appreciate the fact that part of the reason why we have such a high failure rate of black African students at universities in particular, it is because when they are starting with their, with their other colleagues who may be English or African speaking, they are starting on a, on a different base, a lower base. The logic that is taught is not consistent with their logic or the logic that they use at home. And therefore, what we also have to also remember is that psychological defeat is very real. And I, I don't want to, I don't subscribe to your school of thought that says the reason why black Africans or black African-led governments chose English, French, and Portuguese because of trying to prevent themselves from, or, or yeah, of, of avoiding tribalism. The reality is that these languages were never developed as tools of prestige and prosperity. That is the reality. The reality is, when in this country, the 50-50 language policy for English and Africans was, was um, introduced. It was very clear that black African languages were to be confined as tools of racially stereotyped tools of, tra of tradition and culture. And therefore, we should not lie to ourselves and think that simply because the learner is now fluent in English, Portuguese, or Africans, or, or French, and think that that child is going to compete equally with the other children. The reality is that in Africa, 90% of the people are excluded because they cannot speak English, Africans, Portuguese, or French fluently. And as a result, they are starting on a very, very, very low base. They are not competing equally with their other counterparts. And it is therefore very important for us to develop black African languages, of course, it's going to be, it's difficult because you are dealing with, with the fact that there are so many Abantu languages or black African languages in Africa. The, but there is a way around that. You have a language on this other hand, in this country in particular, you have English and Africans. The common denominator there is that they are both, even though we say, we can say their language, their indigenous languages, fine, fair enough, that's okay. They are, they are official languages, we accept that. However, the logic they possess is that of European origin or Western foundations. The black African languages, they possess a different logic and intelligence. As I already said, they arrange their nouns into classes, especially if you're talking about Abantu languages, whether it's Sutu, it's Pedi, it's Kosa, it's Zulu, or Shona, Kikuyu, or whatever. And besides that, these languages are very similar, by the way. It's very, my study, it was very easy, it was very clear to me that it is possible that we can develop an Isindu language, that will have different dialects, the same way as you have in English, where you have New Zealand English, you have Australian English, you have British English, you have American English. Similarly with Isindu, something like that can be done. And language is economics. If, if, if I cannot see myself, remember it's my identity, especially as a black African person, 
The fact that even other politicians go to an extent of saying, you should be happy. I'm not going to tell you about that one, but you know, the one that tweeted and saying black Africans should be happy that colonialism brought them English. Now, English robbed us who we are. The fact that Afro-Americans in the US listen to their English correct, properly, centuries later, they have not mastered that language. They have not. Their grammar is, they're still battling with that grammar. That is because a language is not just a, 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 an event. It's, it's, it's an intergenerational intelligence that is passed on from one generation to the other. The fact that I am Makosi and I'm not Mary is in itself the contestation of a language, of a, the language contestation. And, and let's not lie to ourselves and think that if we, we are going to have this English globally, therefore we are all going to be equal. The truth is black Africans are excluded and as a result, they have low self-esteem. In conclusion, let me close by saying this quote. Ibn Khaldun, for I don't, I, I must confess that I don't like some of his writings, but this particular quote resonates with me very well because it captures the essence of what I'm trying to say. He says he's a, a Tunisian-born uh, 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 philosopher and historiographer. Uh, he, he said, and he lived during the 1200s and 1300s, he said, throughout many his nations, he has never seen a language, a, a people that have recovered from psychological defeat. But those that have survived, uh, that have suffered physical defeat, they do recover. And I wanted to say, a language can actually heal us as black Africans because we can begin to see ourselves as present beings and not be present in our body, but we are absent when it comes to all the symbols and everything that is there in the world. We have been absent for too long. We are always seen as people that are not existing in our multitude. And a language is very important in addressing that deficit. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's something that I'd like to take up, and this is particularly what you said towards the end, around being absent and about being present, because I think it's something, especially presence and also relevance, is something that resonated in the Roads Must Fall conversations on university campuses around the relevance of education and to many degrees, I think also the question around language. Which language are we being taught in? What is the content, obviously, of the curriculum that we are being taught? Who are the people that are teaching us, etc.? Who do they represent? And so I would like to ask Professor Janssen, because he also, of course, is somebody who is currently based at a university, was previously the vice chancellor at a university in this country. And can you reflect for us a little bit more on the benefit of mother tongue education, the benefit of using indigenous mother languages as medium of instruction at universities, and the possible impact of that on, we spoke about it to some extent, academic achievement, cognitive development, issues of relevance around education in that regard. Okay, um, I think Dr. Uh, made a very powerful case for the African languages mm -hmm. and, and I completely agree with that. I, I want to nuance, however, something that both of you said. First of all, I think it's a very dangerous narrative to bring into a sophisticated conversation about the imposition of European languages to defeat tribalism. That's not true. That is a myth I know exists in Afrikaner circles. It's absolutely not true. It never was under colonialism. It certainly is not the case under, uh, after independence. 
uh, what it was was pure and simple European imperialism, you know, that imposed itself on uh, uh, on African and indeed other developing countries' uh, governance. And I think it's very important for you to know that because I heard that thing before from people that that really scared me. I also need to say uh, to that the uh, Afrikaans has a very rich history. One of the other sort of uh, uh, myths in Afrikaanism, particularly among right-wing people like Dan Ruth and others, is that this is a Dutch language, it's bullshit. This is a language that was formed by many different influences, including the slaves, including my ancestors, um, and, 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 and so on. So there's, it's a language that developed, unlike English, with many, many more cultural influences in this country at least. Uh, and, and one must recognize that. It's not a white language. It's a language that claims to be white, but it actually belongs to many more of us, particularly um, uh, uh, on the other side of the Orange River. Now, I want to get to education because this is a little bit more complicated uh, and so on. In a perfect world, in a perfect world, every child should have mother tongue education in every uh, uh, school. And if current policy, as happens in many countries, is that you transition to English after um, uh, grade uh, three, uh, then I think it would work perfectly for children having two languages or three, hopefully, as they progress along the line. The problem at the moment is, and this is empirically true, that the only children who better benefit from mother tongue education in the preschool and foundation phase are white kids who speak Afrikaans and everybody else whose first language is English. They do well academically. So far, <laughs> So good. The problem is that our research has shown that for black African kids in particular, but for black children generally, I mean Steve Biko Black. <laughs> I was waiting for that uh, to, to get to the Methodist people, but um, the, the, uh, the, um, the fact is that you're more likely to do poorly in academics because of poor teaching in any language than because of the fact that you're not taught in an African language. Let me repeat that. The research shows very clearly that children who suckle, who struggle in the first five years of formal education do so not because they taught in, in, in English or in, through code switching and so on, but because they taught the basic concepts of numeracy and literacy and so on and so forth badly regardless of language. Yeah. Which means that what we need to do is to deal with another injustice, not just the language injustice, but the pedagogical injustice. In other words, okay, now, is this going to improve or not? Here's really bad news. If you thought yesterday's cricket match was bad news, <laughs> here's really bad news, okay? The bad news is that two years ago, from the most recent data, the number of black African students studying to become, to get a B.Ed., the basic education degree, in the foundation phase, was literally less than 20. Now I ask you, given that we have 27,000 schools, where the hell are you going to get really qualified teachers to teach Isi Zulu in a competent way? Remember, knowing Isi Zulu is one thing, knowing English is one thing, being able to teach through the language is a completely different thing. You know what I mean? It's a, it helps, but it's a completely different thing. Um, uh, <laughs> and then, of course, there's the issue. Let me just raise another issue. Oh, my God, we just finished a book. I, I'm going to go into hiding when this book comes out <laughs> in June because it's a study of 30 elite primary schools in, in one of the most expensive corridors, suburban corridors on the continent, which is the southern suburbs of Cape Town, from, uh, from uh, the City Bowl all the way to Fisher. We studied all those schools. Did you know that the white schools there, and most of them are still majority white, the Herschels, the Van Riebeks, and so on. I don't know how they get away with it, but read the book. They would rather take a white teacher to teach Isikos than <laughs> to take a mother tongue speaker. I have no idea how these people think, except for, quite bluntly, racism. Here's the really bad news. The black parents also want the white teacher, okay? What I'm trying to give you is a sense of how the world of perception. So I hear, I hear, uh, Dr. Gozan, let me tell you, I, I, I would go out to bat with her any time. 
The truth is the black middle classes don't put their kids in schools where you're going to learn an African language. They put their kids. Where does President Ramaphosa put his kids? Routine and Sinsterians. Where did Naledi Pando put her kids? Bishops and, and her shows. So there is a level, of, where does, by the way, the Spans of African Language Board, I want to show, show me one person who puts their kids in school. So I just want to talk about schools here because I think universities is a completely different story when it comes to mother tongue. I, UK is again was the only university that tried to make a move towards mother tongue. It's not going to work. And the reason it's not going to work is not because it's a bad idea. It's because the choices the middle classes make is not pro-African languages, it is pro-English. And we must face that reality. Now, I'm a pragmatist. I work with what's in front of me. And I say to myself, how can we change this injustice? And I can tell you now, I do research in schools in the nine provinces. I've yet to meet one black family that tells me that they want their kids to be taught in the African languages. They say, Professor, listen here. When I look in Parliament, I don't hear those people speaking my language. They speak English, by and large. They even swear in English. Okay? I want my kid to get there as soon as possible. Now, I think it's a miscalculation, but I don't believe I must judge the choices of poor people when they see the economy is organized in English, the polity is organized in English, mobility is clearly in favor of English. So people make very hard choices based on what they presume to be, so the debate on African languages, you know, with all the love and respect to the two of you, the debate on African languages is a middle class debate, by and large. Poor people have to sit and sort of say, may fuck, but the neck no, okay? <laughs> the whole world uh, requires my CV in English. It requires an interview in English, and you wasting my time here. Now, I don't believe that necessarily means a loss of language, as I often tell Afrikaans speakers, because you go to church in Afrikaans, you, as one of my students said, I even make love in Afrikaans, that's fine, I don't care what you do with your life. But the, the, the end of the language is not simply. What the disadvantage is, of course, is the development of the language, because what academic institutions help do is develop the African languages, develop Afrikaans, and so on and so forth. But there's a very, very, what I'm saying is, the appetite among the middle classes for that to happen is very, very low. And we must figure out what we do with that reality. Our primary problem right now, when up to eight, seven point eight percent out of 10 kids cannot read for understanding, I don't care what languages is, we've got to fix that problem. <laughs> Um, Dr. Koza wanted to immediately respond to Professor Janssen. I will ask her to do that, and then I will hand over and give back to Karin Britz. Um, you know, I've heard this argument that Prof is uh, putting forward of the black middle class parents choosing um, English as opposed to their own black African languages. Now, what I am not hearing, and I've heard that even from Minister Naledi Pando, um, what I am not hearing, though, is the fact that even now, as I speak to you, the black African languages design is defective, and it is colonially inspired, and that is a fact. What do I mean by that? Right now, I will make a very good example of Isi Zulu. Isi Zulu, currently, the way it is taught, what is taught in schools is based on a system that was developed by Karl Maynoff, a German linguist, and who did not necessarily understand the language and um, he also omitted a number of classes and, uh, in his system. That is what is used in South African schools today. The other system that is used is the one that was developed by um, the CM Doak. And that one is even worse than the one that was uh, used by Mainhoff. Now, which parent would actually allow their children to, to learn 
a, a, I mean to learn a language that is taught on a colonially defective platform, design. No, no parent would do that. No parent will do so because obviously these languages are not developed and they are not, the design is defective. They cannot be used anywhere. And even the way they are taught, they are so difficult. A very good example, you can take any Isi Zulu English dictionary and go and look for the word Ibala, which is a wheelbarrow. You will have to find that word under Bala, which means to write. Now, who is going to do that? Ikanda, which is the head. You have to find it under Kanda, which means to fix. How can we say the parents are making a choice simply because of economic reasons or whatever without really talking about a defective design of these languages? The languages, whereas if you are studying English or Africans, if I am looking for the way speak, I will find it as an independent entity in the dictionary. And speech, I will find it as a separate entity. If you are looking for an Isisulu word for speech, or speak, or speaker, you will find it under one stem word, kuluma. And, 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 and for somebody, for the children, they wanted to learn the language. They get confused. And again, even the dictionaries. Remember I said, our languages arrange nouns according to noun clusters. If I say Ngialitanda, in English it is, I like it. If I say Ngialitanda, in English it's still, I like it. But that is different. The dictionaries that we have even today, they don't even indicate the noun cluster from which such a noun comes from, so that we are able to converse in that language. Now, how can we say we base our argument on the parents that are really trying to protect their children from being psychologically molested and insulted? I don't think that the middle class are, are actually doing that simply because of that. I think it's because it makes sense. Even with myself, when my son came back from school and told me that, Mom, you are expecting me to learn Isisulu, a language that has the, the English equivalent, my, that is infinite, I was shocked because I know that I knew that that's not true, but that's what the teacher taught him at school. And again, there is no appreciation of the critical importance of vowels. And again, we are dealing with a racial prejudice issue here. Very, very few people actually even understand that Africa is the home of the most advanced and most revered ancient mathematical tools that we can prove a direct link of these black African languages with those mathematical artifacts that are most revered in the world. That is the Libombo bone, which is over 42,000 years old, and the Ishango bone, that is over 22,000 years old. And I'm talking about bones that have been carbon dated several times, which also, and most mathematicians are even agreeing that black African women may be the earliest mathematicians in the world. And you can see the evidence of this mathematical inclination even in their own languages. Yet in South Africa, we are number last in the world in mathematics. To me, honestly, I am not buying that. I think we are not, we are being lazy. We are not, we don't want it to stretch and actually redesign these languages such that they are able to reconnect with their own logic and intelligence so that black Africans can reconnect with their own mathematical foundations. Finally, let me make an example that you will all relate to. We have a woman in South Africa, Esther Mashal. That woman has never, I mean, she only went to school up to lower primary. 
and the end you are wearing some of the work of some of these black African women. Let me tell you, geometry is in their blood. You look at their beadwork, go today to any shop, look at how these uneducated women with very little contact with Western education, how easy it is for them to make these geometric shapes. They don't need the tracing paper. It's in their head. Because their language, I have subjected Isizulu even to Excel. And when you are subjecting it, because it is very, it follows strict patterns, and I've reduced it to numbers. And you can actually see where this comes from. And I am saying, if you are going to be saying, let's go for this and base it on the middle class and not base it on empirical evidence, on the properties and the attributes of those languages, I think we are missing the point. And again, I think we will be missing the point because then we, do, we, are, not, we are not appreciating what it means to be a, coming from a, 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 a group of the human race that has been subjected to total psychological onslaught for centuries. You are told every single day you are nothing. Your language is nothing. Your hair is nothing. Your skin pigmentation is wrong and all that. If we are not going to fix that and then follow only the middle class that has even failed, by the way, with all their degrees and whatnot, to even notice that the, the problem is not necessarily the language, but it is the design of the language. Thank you. Thank you. Karin? Yes, um, I think um, when you said that, when I referred to English as something that is to prevent tribalism is an Afrikaans opinion. It's not true. I base it on um, international studies where they studied language patterns and language plans and language ideology in, in Africa. Um, and I think one should, should be, be, be careful. I just pointed it out that it might be one of the reasons why we have chosen English. I don't say that I agree with that. Definitely, I don't agree with that. I, I believe in multilingualism, and I totally agree that we should move away from the middle class argument and look what's the best for children. And the best for children is a mother child. And if we want to really decolonize our mind, we should start to think in the, the, the language, languages of this continent. Um, and I. I totally agree that yes, there are many factors contributing to um, the language or the, the uh, education sector in South Africa. Um, and I do agree that language is not everything in education, but without language, that everything is nothing. So we can't exclude language. I do agree we need uh, qualified teachers. I totally agree, apart from the language factor. But we can't separate language and education. I, I think we need to approach it from all sides. And to say that they are not material in, available in the African language, that's not true. And if it's not available, we have really experts to do it. Um, I want to, to agree with you. The whole thing of um, Minov and Doug, when I studied um, Tswana Zulu, I also studied French, and I thought, oh my goodness, now I understand why, why there are moods in French, based on what I learned in Tswana and, and Zulu. But is that really the case? Should we talk about moods in African languages? I totally agree we should have a new approach to African languages, because we are, we are still influenced by the missionaries and they they were trained in latin so i can i can see how they actually yeah, transpose that latin onto african languages and that's not the way we think when you think in african languages so i totally agree we need a fresh approach to african languages thank you very much what i would like to do now before we open the floor
um, and allow the audience and everybody here who's been sitting here so patiently listening to us to engage us. I would like to give um, all three of you kind of like a last uh, a chance to speak. Uh, perhaps you want to respond to a couple of things that were, that were mentioned. But what I would like you to respond to is to say, when you look at the situation of, or the context of mother language education in South Africa, and I think we've understood that there's no consensus and that we are talking about a very complex, multifaceted phenomenon where we, you have shared with us the diversity of perspectives and of understandings of actually what this is, you know, mother tongue education. But is there something, considering that we are hosted by the Goethe Institute today and that they are celebrating International Mother Language Day with a variety of partners representing other languages and other cultures, is there something from the South African experience and from the South African context that we can perhaps share and say, you know, um, here is perhaps something that we have learned already or are busy learning because obviously this is not something where we will probably ever arrive at a particular point. But from this conversation and from your engagement, um, I'd like to invite you to share, um, you know, is there something that we can offer to a more global kind of like conversation on mother tongue education? Um, I, I think Europe experience um, really a, a shift from being monolingual to become multilingual. Um, because suddenly the languages you hear in street are not only German or Dutch, but you start to hear languages like Turkish, um, which other languages, I don't want to, to uh, single out certain languages, but you start to hear many other languages. And I sometimes think that people might feel, oh, I'm going to lose my language. And that's not the case. Now, I want to agree that if I learn another language, I'm not going to lose my own language. I only add. So I would tell them, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Try to learn the other languages that you hear around you. It's going to enrich you. Um, and view language as a resource. I sometimes think we problematize language. We say, oh my goodness, how are we going to handle all these languages? Are we going to have enough money? Forget about that. View language as a resource and see it as a, a new development um, and new ways of seeing life, not the only way that you grow up in. Dr. Koza? Well, I think, um, Maybe it might sound as if I'm contradicting myself here, but I think every South African child must learn English at school. And my view, my strong view is that at lower grades from grade R up to about grade four or so, or grade three, the instruction should be in mother tongue. However, once the learners are going up higher, they should continue with their languages that they, are, they consider as their home language and not necessarily, I don't want to get into this debate of mother tongue or whatever, but I'm talking about the language that people um, speak at home and so forth. They should be, in South Africa, if we want to truly reconcile this society, Every single school should obviously study English, but it can also elect to study Afrikaans if they want to. However, each school must, it must be compulsory for a black African language to study until you complete your, uni you complete your, your schooling, until matric. To me, I think that is what will make this country a country, a better country to live in. And again, I'm also saying, it's also important for us, if we are going to be doing that, we need to correct the chronically defective design of black African languages. As I speak to you now, 
there are no grammar textbooks that are prescribed or that are in the national catalog of the Department of Basic Education. How can you study a language that does not have a grammar textbook? And I'm saying, let's correct it. And the good news is, we have already started doing that. I have actually reviewed the, the, the domain of Ntok as clown out class system, and I'm not saying they are, they are useless. I think the, the answer lies between, in between the two systems. And we've done that, and we've worked on it with other principals, and it works perfectly well. And I think in that way, our nation will reconcile and we will embrace diversity because I wouldn't like to see South Africa losing its rainbow nation status. And that rainbow nation status is more expressed in our linguistic. Um, diversity. Prof, over to you. Yeah, um, let me just say where I, dis where I agree and disagree with my two colleagues. I, I absolutely agree with the fact that there should be, and this is a normative position, this is not reality, but this is a normative position, that there should be massive investments in the development of the African languages at schools and universities. Yeah. There should be massive investments in the training of teachers, particularly primary school teachers, in the African languages um, uh, in, uh, across all our schools. Uh, the very first paper I wrote as a young <laughs> graduate student was a call for every region of this country, before we had provinces even. Mm. Uh, in which the the regional African language becomes part of the curriculum. On that we can, on that I agree. Okay, completely. Not just for reasons of of communication, mm. but for reasons of of culture, for reasons of history, for reasons of politics, by the way, and for reasons of a heritage that we have that we're not really fully using. Um, having said that, you know, uh, I work 18 hours a day with schools, mm. and if you're going to tell me that any of these ideas are going to happen in my lifetime is not going to happen. Because for that to happen, you need a political will, similar to what the Afrikaners did when, after Union in 1910, in which they said to hell with everybody else's language, okay, we are now starting to move state resources in a major way to develop Afrikaans. And by the way, if you don't like it, we'll impose it on you, which gave us 76, okay? It, needed, oh, it was a krachtadigheid, you know, that led to Afrikaans' success in that sense. I don't think there's a political appetite. As, as much as I agree uh, with Dr. Koza, I would go to war with her on that one, as from a curriculum point of view. Yeah. But I'm telling you now, there isn't a political appetite to do that, and I, can, I remain with my argument that when I talk to parents in the Bundes, um, you know, uh, you take a school like Pretoria, boys. <laughs> go there and see how many of those kids come from Afrikaans. So people make calculations, okay, whether we like it or not about what language gets them ahead. Mm -hmm. Because, as you correctly say, we failed to solve this problem. So I enjoy uh, these debates. I would uh, you know, invest huge monies, if I had any, in developing uh, our indigenous languages. But let me just tell you something. If there's no uptake, you can develop grammar books. But as you know, if the Department of Basic Education doesn't subscribe them, you're going to go nowhere. You know? And I've had so many people come to me with fascinating books in African languages and so on and so forth. So what do we do on Monday morning? That's what I have to deal with, okay? That's where my life is with schools. I'm gonna make sure that every kid passes well. Mm -hmm. And ideally, with the aid of uh, a, a home language. But that's not gonna happen for a very long time. What did the president do the other day in the State of the Nation? I was so upset. He says, we've got all these realities that we're dealing with, ESCOM, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Then he goes over. But there's another beautiful reality. 81% of our children pass. What the What's fuck? I mean, what? Oh. half the yeah. kids dropped yeah. out. Exactly. Yeah. They know where to be yeah. seen. Yeah. There's a 30 and 40% passes. Mm. Okay? More fewer kids are doing mathematics now than in yeah. 2017. No, man. I believe that every African child, black or white, Okay. Prof, can maybe perform, I should go back to politics. Can perform. That political way. I told you you should never have left Scopa. <laughs> uh, you know. Anyway, and and it I, was you, Dr. Koza, who said no politics today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. I'm being sold out there over here, but um, uh, 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 it's hard. But 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 listen. Let me also just say this finally in terms of the language, the the politics of language. Make no mistake. 
okay, that the 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 challenge to English mm. as a dominant language is happening in other parts of the Anglophone world, yeah. and there's a resistance. There's a poisonous anti, you know, a sort of a resistance. You see it with Trump. I mean, places like Texas and California that I know quite well, let me tell you something. There's no way English is going to be the dominant language there. Okay? It's Spanish. Mm. Okay? L uh, Latino uh, immigrants mm. and so on. And so you don't go for the language, you go for the people. people. And you try to, to break them down. I talked to my Dutch, the, the, you know, the Holland is one of the most progressive countries in Europe, in my view. But I tell you, you want to see people's dark side, if you forgive the metaphor. It's when they see Turkish people speaking Arabic, you know, and they start to question what does it mean to be Dutch. So across the world, these are not just issues of, um, you know, textbooks and curricula and trained teachers. It's also issues of attitude, you know, towards people who don't look like you or speak yeah. your language. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm so glad that we finally found something where everybody seems to be in agreement and nodding. And that's a wonderful opportunity for me to actually open the floor. Thank you. Hello. Okay, working. Um, I've got an open question. So um, I'd, I'd actually be interested to get everyone's opinion on this. And it's kind of a hypothetical situation. It was mentioned that specifically black middle class parents tend to opt, if you can afford it, for one of these prestigious English schools, Scythians and, and all those who were mentioned. And I was just be curious, you know, if there were a school that's similar to those types of schools in terms of education level and everything they do, um, that were instru where instruction took place in one of the African languages, would the you know, parents still opt so strongly in favor of the English school. So in other words, is it really the language that attracts people or is it the whole culture and the whole, you know, education that goes with it? And to what extent is that maybe intermingled in people's minds as well? You know, maybe a person thinks a school is very good because it teaches in English, because it's been associated so much, so much with each other. Um, so that's my question. Thank you. Can we have two more? There was a gentleman there in the back uh, near the shelf. Um, Prof. Prof. Janssen, I have a quick question about the Afrikaans. You said when the speakers invited you to speak about um, Afrikaans parents not educating or teaching their own children Afrikaans, raising them in English. Um, that would be the first place where I would suggest people could help with mother tongue education. It's just teaching their own children and all of them and then sending them to English schools because then they become multilingual. If we start them in English, then they, it's much harder for them to become multilingual. Whereas if we teach our own children in our own languages and in English, then they can immediately go further and learn more languages more easily. Um, would that be a good... My question is basically, would that be a good thing to encourage? Uh, I think that would be a place where all of us can agree we can encourage that part at least. Okay, let's take one more question. There is an arm here, right back in the front. Sorry, Amanda, we're making you run now. I think you're going to be the fittest of us all there. Um, I, I just like to say the Amnesty International report that was produced on education talks about a broken system. Um, we find that most schools don't have the necessary infrastructure. My question is really to uh, Dr. Corsa to say, whilst we want to have African languages and we want to accommodate everybody. We want to be politically correct and in, an inclusive uh, system. Can the government really afford when we really need to focus on infrastructure right now? When the president has got such a big emphasis on 4IR, for instance, coding, coding is not done in any of the black languages. Can we afford to push resources that way? Because when I speak to children in school, I find that all they want to do is compete on a global, uh, global platform, especially around computers, and those are not, those manuals are certainly not written in any of the black languages. 
Thank you. I think those are three languages, uh, sorry, three <laughs> questions that we can tackle. Prof. Janssen, can I ask you to respond to the one that was directed to you about Afrikaans and the role that parents play? No, I mean, Afrikaans was the example, but generally parents teaching their children first and foremost in the mother tongue and then... Yeah, if you don't mind, can I speak to the first two? Um, the first of all, the... Uh, that's a very good question. Again, um, the, 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 we have a whole chapter in the book as to why parents choose schools. And you're right, uh, it's not just the language, it's the perception of a white school with two swimming pools and a water polo pool and, and, and white teachers. I mean, sadly, sadly, uh, as being better regardless of what happens in other schools and so on. Just to give you an example, um, uh, uh, and this is just three examples that we studied in Bilwi High School in Toyando. It's one of the best science and math schools in this country. I don't know how many people know that. Uh, in Bilwi, in Umlazi, you know, South Peninsula High School, in, um, in uh, Deep River. And, and I often say to black parents, why the hell did you just send the middle classes? Why didn't you send your kids there? I, you, first of all, you're paying almost nothing and you're getting the best teaching. It's because of the other. You see, when you can claim, let me just use where I now live as an example. When you can say, my son is a bishop's boy, you get access to a job interview even if you're a total idiot. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and because it's the package. It's the package. And sadly, that is, that is the case. Look, again, uh, the, the question the, the uh, guy asked at the back there is, is obviously a good question, but even as I listen to you asking the question, I know there's so many layers behind, not for you perhaps, behind Afrikaans and its activism that I know a simple answer is not going to really satisfy. Afrikaans is in a state of existential crisis right now for a whole lot of people. And I tell you the violent reaction I saw the other day when I questioned uh, somebody who refused to speak to me in my mother tongue, she just refused, this is a woman working in a shop, she just refused, she made me invisible because she's going to speak to Afrikaans because in her estimation, my face says to her, I can speak Afrikaans regardless of my levels of comfort. And, and, and so Afrikaans is not a, it's not a simple language. It comes with the ethnic nationalism that I'm telling you now is very deeply rooted uh, 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 in, in some parts of that community. Having said that, again, I agree. The, I used the example of my granddaughter for a purpose. She's learning three languages. She's not even two years old. I love the fact that she can speak Afrikaans a little bit and a little bit of English and a little bit of Maori. And I would like her parents not to force her into a choice. You know, let her go through schools in which, and when she comes back home, hopefully, in, in a year or two, I obviously would like her, if they're going to live in Johannesburg, to learn one of the African languages in this, uh, in this region. But it mustn't be a source of anxiety. It should be a source of joy that when your child is truly multilingual, okay, the world opens up for them mm. in ways that wouldn't be the case if they only knew English and Afrikaans. And perhaps I can just uh, come in with a personal detail and take, take the attention away a little bit from Afrikaans. I know and understand why we're talking about Afrikaans so much. But when you ask that question, for example, my husband is from Zimbabwe, so he speaks Shona. And when our children were born, we had this conversation, in which language are we going to raise our children? I said, I'll speak German. He said, I'll speak Shona. And with everybody else, they speak English first and foremost. Um, but I know a lot of Zimbabweans in South Africa who do not speak Shona with their children. Um, and I think I've seen them then travel to Zimbabwe and visit the grandparents and they are unable to talk to their own grandparents or people who live on the farms and don't speak English. And so that's, for example, the immediate connection that I made and kind of like nodded, you know, to say absolutely I think there is a role that parents play. Um, you shared your own example, your personal example, and the circumstances under which your children, you were actually not able to do that and your children were sent um, uh, to boarding school and, and lost, like you said, that Isi Zulu, their, 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 their mother tongue. But um, um, let me come back to the second question that was directed to you, Dr. Koza, on um, the Amnesty International report, the broken system, finance, and the question around affordability of it all. Um, I think, first of all, let's agree that um, the infrastructure backlog is real, and obviously it is it is another complex issue in the equation. But let's not 
treat these two as if they are trade-offs that you must trade off a language for infrastructure because they are not trade-off issues you can't trade off this for the other we need both and the reason why I, I am saying so you know, you, you were making reference to Steve Bigo. If there is one single person that I think should be studied in history in South Africa, it's Steve Bigo. Because of how he went into detail about mental slavery. Because some of the problems that we are sitting with, and even the choices that our parents are making, or black parents are making, they are also part of that. Because all your life you've been told that this is prestigious, this is the, the aspiration that you should be looking at. You've been taught to despise yourself in your entirety. And therefore the language is really to me a healing tool as well. To reconnect black Africans with who they are. Remember that they've lost almost everything. They lost land, they lost everything you can think of. And in some communities, like with Kosa speaking people, some of them, they even lost their surnames. They lost their names, like the same way as the slaves, the, the former slaves in, in, the US, in, the, in the US and elsewhere in the diaspora. So I am saying to you, we must look at it more as a healing tool and as a way of reconnecting black Africans with who they are. And by the way, contrary to the widely held view, there is a silent revolution that is going on as we speak. How many soapies of Zulu do we have right now on TV? Isibaya, Uzalo, Imbeu, and everybody is crazy about them. Even people that are not even speaking the language, they wanted to sit there and watch that. And again, I also wanted to say to you, there is that revolution in KZN as a good example. Ison Lenswe is a very new daily newspaper, relatively new. When it came out, it overtook the, Ma the Natal Witness, the, um, the Mercury. All these newspapers were well established over 100, uh, over 100 years. And it is the most read newspaper, which means that people are really looking for the materials that are relevant, that they can read, that they can relate to. And again, you even have, by the way, for those of you that don't know, even the Sunday Times is now available in Zulu. So whatever else that they may be saying, there is a revolution that is taking place. And in fact, there is also a silent revolution that you can see. A lot more black people are even very happy now with the texture of their hair. There are more dreadlocks now than we had when I grew up. In fact, when I grew up, we used to associate dreadlocks with Rastafarians and, and Dacha. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's what we, that, I mean, if you came with dreadlocks, all we, we saw, all we saw in you was just Dacha cannabis. And that's all we saw. But now there is something brilliant that is happening. And I think we must count these, these gains and we must build on these small gains and as, as we move forward. But whilst I'm saying that, I am saying, Africans is actually one thing that I, re I regret not learning. Ne? I hated Africans, I must confess. And I hated Africans because of politics. Now that I am older and I'm now beginning to look at life in a much more mature way, I'm saying, good Lord, it is <laughs> You know, and I love it because it's so expressive. And I'm saying, let's embrace diversity. It can only make all of us better people. Before we, before we go for another round, Karin, there was especially that first question that was open to the panel around perceptions and, and parents' uh, choices in terms of schools and the intertwined nature of language and culture and everything that comes with that. We talked about reputation and the full package. Um, I think um, parents want the best for their children. 
So they will perceive, okay, um, that was a former white school, so it should be, there should be quality. Um, but is it really the case? Well, it might be, but there might be a, a brilliant school in Soweto where you can actually learn more. Um, so we should, we should always question ourselves and our own perceptions. I think that's, that's, a, that's the key here. And I, I would actually would like to say, it's a, it's a, we should think about the economic principle of supply and demand, that revolution. If people start to speak Zulu, if they start to read Zulu, the Abelungu is going to start. They are going to start to speak Zulu because if I want to have access to Zulu and what they are saying, I should actually learn it. And I mean that's the biggest language in this country. Why are we not why are we speaking English right now? We actually supposed to, Yeah, we should speak Zulu now. Let's have an must be careful about that element that you were talking about because we also don't want to be Imposing yeah. one group as being better than the other and using one other. <laughs> no, no, go, go for it, huh? You're sure? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Look, let me just throw this into the pot, okay? Because I've been living with this now for the past 20 years or so. You must be very, very careful when white African speakers tell you yeah. we must promote African languages because it is a double edged sword there. On the one end, it sounds progressive, but it's not progressive. Mm. It carries with it that old apartheid thing, that every ethnic group has its own language and settle down in your language. So while you might see it as a powerful political moment to put off the, you know, the chains of, of colonialism and apartheid, it very often is used to reinsert people within their tribal groupings. I'm just throwing that out there to keep at the yeah, back yeah. of your mind. It's never innocent when um, I've been in hundreds of these debates. It is not innocent, as uh, I said. I, I totally and, agree. We and, need a and, so, and so the approach that says, which I think both of you said, why don't we have all our children learn an African language exactly. in the schools? That then breaks down, you know, those kinds of stereotypes of who speaks what language. Yes, thank you. When your panelists start talking without their microphones, then you think, you know, you're about to lose control. <laughs> so I would like to take control back to the room. And please, can we have another round of questions? I see there's quite a number of arms up, but let's try and do three, and then hopefully we'll come back for some more. Hello, everybody. So my name is Zami here. I'm from the Witz Language School. My comment, right, it's linked to what Professor has said. He said the language and politics is always linked. And um, Ausblit says, says, yes, we also need to learn language and um, uplift African languages. However, as a deaf person with my experience, right, the tools of language can be also be a tool of oppression. So far, people have used language to oppress deaf learners in schools, right? Which for us is also an issue. So far, with my experience in my language, my dominant language actually, my mother language, is sign language. However, it is not even an official language as yet. Everybody's speaking, speaking and saying this is going to happen. Even Ramaphosa last week said in the SONA that South African sign language will be the 12th official language soon. However, we're not sure when that's going to happen because it has been a language that has been um, left and not really um, li um, uh, made sure to, uh, to, 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 to develop as well. So for my language, I want to be able to learn in South African Sign Language, to be competent in that language so that I can also have access um, to other universal things as well. So yes, sign language need also needs to be recognized. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, I, have, uh, I have a question. In fact, let me start with a statement. I have um, a friend of mine, quite an erudite. He uh, made reference one day to Africa using a single language. He said, look, my friend, um, give me 
how, how do you explain uh, complex engineering or economic factors in Isizulu? Hey, I didn't have an answer, you know. But um, I'm from a IT background. And um, there's one thing that I know about uh, computers. Computers neither speak, don't speak uh, Zulu nor English. They speak ones and zeros, which means you can convert a program to, to say anything you want. I mean, the other day I was translating a Chinese website into English, and I understood exactly what they, they intended uh, for me to understand. Um, but I think the greater challenge is the climax that we're living in right now is a digital orientation uh, environment. Now, we have our kids going to school, learning different languages and the likes, yes. It's understood that uh, English is a, 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 an international business language and uh, it helps with competitive issues. How then does a parent help train their child in understanding their mother language as well as in being competitive in a digitally inclined economy and help them to be competitive? Because only, you can only apply so much pressure on the teacher, on the, uh, uh, on the school, and on the, you know, on the department. At the end of the day, you know, learners are ours. I happen to be a uh, project manager of, um, of a learning center. I actually train um, you know, uh, primary school kids in how to read. And the biggest challenge that I found is the initiative, the greater part of the initiative has to be taken at home. Now, I might be one of those, you know, I suppose you can call me a maverick or revolutionary, who would say, let me try and teach these kids, let me step in where I see their parents would most need to. But furthermore, how then do we equip the parents to do what our, uh, uh, what, 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 you know, what you believe is necessary? what prof believes is necessary, what uh, 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 um, mem believes is necessary. What does the parent need to do? How do we do that? Thank you. Okay. Um, Amanda, please, if we could go to the back and mm -hmm. uh, take the question from there, and then I'm going to ask the panelists to respond. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Carlos. I am from Institute Camões, an ex-colonist of uh, Africa. And I just, since we are celebrating uh, home Mother Language Day. I just wanted you to, to also offer another uh, <coughs> panorama in Africa of the uh, Portuguese-speaking countries in Africa. It was a political decision, and until 1964-65, the Portuguese never succeeded the majority of the populations of Angola, Mozambique, Cape Verde, Guinea-Bissau, or Santo Tome Prism to, le to learn and speak Portuguese. They resisted. But in 61 started the armed struggle in three fronts, in Angola, Mozambique, and uh, Guinea-Bissau. And then all the liberation movements, all the leaders, decided that Portuguese was also their own. It was also a Mozambican language, it was also an Angolan language, and they declared it as a deliberation language. Which is, I'm not saying that it's right or wrong, eh? but it was a political decision eh? that from one day to the other changed the status eh? and the perception of Portuguese eh? amongst Angolans, Mozambicans, and the other countries that are Portuguese speaking today. And then when it came to independence, they went a, fair, a further step <coughs> up. They declared Portuguese as the language of national unity. And nowadays, just to give you an example, in Angola, with 30 million people, 70% of the population has Portuguese either as mother language or as first language. So I, my point is just, it was a political decision. It is up to the parents, to the educators, to decide to, to let it go. But there is no doubt today. In the minds of Angolans and Mozambicans, Cape Verdeans and Guineans and Santo Tome, 
that Portuguese is not their own language. It's a completely situation uh, different of South Africa, where, Portu where Afrikaans or even English is still associated with uh, apartheid or with uh, coloniza colonization. Thank you. Thank you. I think it would be interesting to have some representatives from those many countries that you've mentioned and have a similar conversation with them. But um, since you did not address any of these questions to a specific panelist, I'm going to just invite all three of you to speak. Um, so there was the first question just to remind us about sign language. Um, the second one focused on parents again and, and moving the focus from the child maybe to the focus on the parent and how we can equip them with the balance of mother language um, education and what is perhaps perceived to be um, enabling children to be more competitive. Um, and then the last point again that I think links to a lot of the conversation that we had previously around um, political decisions around the continued use of colonial languages on the African continent. Karin, shall we start with you? Um, what I, I think I'm going to say is it's actually might sound a little bit obvious, but how many of our parents take time to sit down with our child on our lap, forget about the app, on the lap and read to them, whichever language. Um, well, of course, I would say mother tongue, reading to them in the mother tongue. Um, one thing is they expand the vocabulary and there's that psychological safety. So um, I would start with the basics. Read, read, read. Whichever language or languages that you speak in, in your, in your um, um, householding. So um, I think it's straightforward. Read. Yeah, I do um, I think regarding the sign language, there is no doubt that we, we definitely need to have it somehow. Maybe we need a constitutional amendment that includes the, the sign language because um, it does tend to be forgotten all the time and it's always remembered as, you know, as a by the way and, and not necessarily as an integral part of the language landscape of our country. So, um, and regarding the question that you have asked me, sir, you know, it goes back and it, in fact, it links to what you were saying when you made a point about coding. You were saying the, the black African languages, I think you said something to the effect that they cannot be coded. That is untrue. Um, you know, we've done a study and um, we fixed the, um, the, 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 the chronically defective design of Isizulu. And my son, by the way, has developed a very accurate Isizulu translation, um, translating, translation of Isizulu into English. It beats even Google Translate. As you know, in any language, for any language to survive nowadays, let's face it, it's got to be available on e-platforms. And it's got to be accurate, and it's got to make sense. If it doesn't make sense, it's going to lose its relevance and significance. So that is why we actually went through that. But the other thing you were talking about, the fact that there are no um, black African languages, um, terminologies, uh, engineering terminologies, I am saying to you, that is actually not true. English is one of the most notorious language that borrows from everybody. And, and why, why can't we borrow from all the other developed languages? We don't have to reinvent the wheel. And the Zulus have proven that uh, it's easy to do this thing. For example, neutron. They just say in neutron. They don't try with coming with something or, or microwave. It will be a microwave, you know, because with them, they have syllables that are based on the five vowel sets and each syllable must always trace its origin to the vowel driven set. So 
I am saying to you, it, it, these things can happen. All that has to be done is that that language just adapts that language to its own logic and intelligence. And then you have the way, it doesn't mean that they have to be coming up with new terminologies altogether. However, I agree with you because we do have uh, a group of linguists that are purists. I, I'm not a purist. I, I have a problem with them because I used to sit, by the way, in the, in the, in the, in the board of, of the University of KwaZulu Natal um, um, that was coming up with terminologies, science terminologies in Zulu. And some of the strangest things, for example, there were some of them were even arguing that, uh, you know, we should call the microwave is futumezi. Is food amazing, meaning something that warms the food. I said, no, no, no. But then it loses this, uh, the, the technological advancement because a microwave tomorrow, today it even defrosts, okay? Tomorrow it can even freeze things. So what are you going to do? <laughs> and the same thing with the, the cell phone. It, you know, they, they came up with the word for Isizulu for a cell phone. Who knows it? Umakale <laughs> kukwini. The thing that rings in the pocket, that's what it means. Now, how about us as women? We have this thing in our handbags. Now, you understand what I'm saying? So I'm saying the purists do tend to stunt the language by trying to, to, to describe what it does at that particular moment instead of just taking the language and adapting it to what it is used for. There is nothing wrong with that. Thank you. Prof. I'm definitely not going to reveal what rings in my pocket, but <laughs> <laughs> let me just say, I, I think an injustice that we have to deal with and look square in the face is the, the issue that we talk sign language on paper, but we don't give it uh, authority in the classroom. We don't train enough teachers. We don't recognize children uh, who... Uh, you know, whom sign language is their mode. So I, I'm, I think at every one of these education meetings, we must put it on the table mm -hmm. so that the president doesn't just mention it, but that there are resources backing up the implementation of, of, uh, of sign language programs and so on. I agree with that completely. Um, I, I think, you know, what's interesting for me is Zimbabwean students. I, I did my doctoral field work in Zimbabwe for two years in a place called Chinoy, northeast of Harare. And, and, and you know what, if you take South Africa today, do you know who the smartest students are in South African undergrad? It's Zimbabwean students. You go and look at programs in actuarial science, what well, the student that I've helped raise funding for in civil engineering, who got 80% and 90% in everything. Guess what you got 80% in? Afrikaans. Ooh, even you guys don't get 80% in Afrikaans, right? Here's a kid from Zimbabwe, and we, I mean, the money came in, South Africans and Zimbabweans, by the way, gave huge money, and we we're able to cover all the studies for this year, and we do. You know why I do that? Because I know with a Zimbabwean student, that student will get a degree. I've seen it over and over again with students we supported in the free state. So, but Zimbabwe has, has a very colonial system. It's got O and A levels. You know, for the exams, how colonial can you be? You know, uh, they extremely good in English, uh, etc. So I'm not saying that to displace the argument about mother tongue education, but I am saying when you have a strong school system, other things also happen, including mother tongue. But you have to have a strong school system, and and that the Zimbabweans have have shown us. I like the notion that was thrown in here about how to bring in parents. Most of my work, as you know, is with poor schools. And I'm trying to figure out how do we get to scale the kind of reforms that we need in our schools. So I've now, I'm a patron of something called Math Moms. Math Moms takes the poorest children, uh, you know, in some very violent areas like uh, uh, Elsie's River, and we've now expanded it to, uh, to Kaimandi and Lavendale. But I want to take this national as a patron. Because what they do is they take unemployed mothers, right? You're going to like this as an IT guy. They take unemployed mothers and they teach their mathematics. So that when your child comes home, <laughs> you know, in, in a middle class family, you help your child you know, as far as you can. Now they help. But you know what the upside is of this program? Those, some of those mothers are now mathematics teachers in our schools. And what do they do it in? The home language. So I think we need to think 
as you're suggesting, out of the box here, and not think this is going to only come from government, you know? Yeah. Maybe we should use uh, the resources of, of parents, particularly mothers, and there's a win-win situation here, because the mother gets adult education, the children get good uh, technical education. Wonderful. I think this is going to be our final, our final statement, because I've got good news and bad news for you. I'll start with the bad news. We have to finish. I'm, I'm, uh, there is some sort of sign language that I can read that tells me that I've been asked to close the session. But the good news is that there is going to be an Umtrunk, as they say in German, uh, some refreshments and some drinks. And uh, so you are all invited. We will still be here for a bit. Come talk to us. But we have to, at this point, close the session. And I would like to thank my three panelists for coming and spending time with us and sharing so generously your experiences, your thoughts, your passions. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming, of course, and to the Goethe Institute for the invitation and for hosting us today. Thank you, Samia.